skills to give everyone more of an inside look at cer how certain games are made. We're going to start doing presentations this semester, and if it goes well next semester, talking about different games, mostly games that we've worked on. But today, I'm going to take apart the, go into the guts of Age of Empires. So, this is one game that we don't have the source code for, but we have a lot of devoted fans. So, we've cracked quite far into this one. And I'm going to start with the game itself and then talk about how we mod the game, how it's, what you can do to mod the game, how many different tools people have made and stuff. So anyway, back in the mid-90s, there was an entrepreneur in Texas named Tony Goodman. And he ran Ensemble Corporation, which was an insurance company. He had some really A-plus programmers, but they were also bored out of their skulls doing financial work. So he talked to his friend Bruce Shelley, who he knew from high school, and he started peppering him with questions about the game industry, wondering, hey, how, how does a company do this? How do they do that? How does a release work? And then eventually he got uh, Bruce Shelley on board and Sandy Peterson, both of whom worked at Microprose at the time, and Sandy Peterson had also worked on at id. So we've got people working on Sid Meier's games and on Doom, coming in to work at his new Ensemble Studios. So they had programmers, they had uh, people who knew how to design games. They didn't really have any artists. So they went to some art schools and started recruiting people straight out of school who could make 3D models. Not people who had done a, uh, game art before, but more gearing towards movie art animation. So, started hiring some people for their new ensemble studios, and one philosophy that Sid Meier's endowed upon Bruce Shelley was, you gotta test your game as soon as possible. So, they started out with paper prototypes before they even had a program running. Paper prototypes of a real-time strategy game, as ridiculous as, as that sounds. <coughs> kept working on it, kept testing and iterating it, eventually they had a prototype working called Dawn of Man. Meanwhile, the artists were working on concept art, which they would later render into full 3D models, kind of like what you'd see in a movie. Not like anything you'd have in games back then. And then uh, put together this prototype called Dawn of Man. And the game was still kind of finding its identity. It wasn't Age of Empires yet. It had some save elements. It was real time, though, not turn-based. And they pitched it to a few different publishers. Because back then, you didn't have this big indie scene. You needed a publisher if you wanted to make a game. So one of the publishers was Microsoft. And there were a few others who showed interest, but um, Microsoft was willing to give them the backing they needed. Microsoft was willing to do it in a timely manner, so they went with Microsoft. And uh, needless to say, the game was a hit. And it sold like three million copies. And this is in 1997 when which was called the Year of the RTS by some magazines, because there were like over 50 real-time strategy games coming out that year. So to even stick out a little bit from all the competition was significant. To be one of the very top-selling ones out of all the competition is huge. So that was a huge hit. Uh, they originally planned one year later to put out Age of Empires 2, and they kept working on it, they kept coming up with new ideas, so they're like, there's no way we should put we can put this out in a year. So they talked to Microsoft, and Microsoft allowed them to make an expansion pack for Age of Empires called Rise of Rome, and put that out in between. And then, two years after Age of Empires, came Age of Empires 2, where the studio really hit its stride. Uh, most people consider it the best Age of Empires game, and the best Age game ever. And the studio continued putting out great games. All, their, all the games here, except Halo Wars, are on the list of top-selling PC games of all time that says anything, the franchise has sold over 15 million. And Halo Wars is not a PC game, which is why it's not on the list, of course. Why do you even include it? Because it's also developed by Ensemble Studios. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's the only console game that they did. This was my childhood back when I was. So, they were working on, uh, they finished Halo Wars, they were working on some other games, including a future, age, some concepts for a future Age of Empires game, this was included in the Age of Empires 3 manual. They were planning to go up to 5, bring it way into the future. And they were also developing a Halo MMO for Xbox 360 at the time. But then in 2009, Microsoft shut them down 
there was a bunch of new management. They hadn't quite known Ensemble as long, hadn't been through the hard times with them, so to speak. And they said, hey, this PC gaming stuff's old. We're all Xbox and tablets these days. So this is the same Microsoft management that would go on to release Windows 8, which we all love so much. But they shut down Ensemble, and Microsoft owned, <laughs> owned the franchise at that point. So in between, in between then and now, there's been a few uh, cruddy Age of Empires apps. They weren't all that bad. Age of Empires Online was pretty bad at its release, but admittedly it was patched into a great game. It was an MMORTS. Unfortunately, first yeah, impressions mean an awful lot. So it never really redeemed itself and didn't have a great reputation. Uh, there was a couple apps. One of those, Age of Empires World Domination, only stayed online for about a year. A year, if that tells you how good it was. And that one that looks like a Clash of Clans clone is exactly that. Not much to it. But despite the fact that a the Age of Empires series was kind of more or less the mainline series was dead, there were still devoted fans. And there were these heaven fan sites which maintained active forums, they had stable user communities for all three Age of Empires games. Not, just, Empires not just the newer one. Like Age of Empires 1, 2, and 3 had active modding communities and active forums at which you could, uh, you could post a question, get a response, if, like within a day, for a 15-year-old game or whatever. Isaac, did you have a question? What about Age of Apology? Did it have much uh, of the It like does that? have a Heaven Games form also. It does one? Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's following as quite as big. Not, I mean, none of them are as big as two. I mean, obviously. But just forgot to include that one. Uh, there's also a game called Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds, which was not developed by Ensemble, but it was made using the exact same engine as Age of Empires 1 and 2. Fun yeah, fact. So, so, yeah, even with the official series kind of out the window, the games were still alive. Alive and booming. There was actually a project called Project Celeste that brought back servers, so you can now play Age of Empires online, online again. And that was, that game was completely hosted by Microsoft. It's not like you could just start up your own server. So this would be like something like if Xbox Live went down and someone started their own live service that you could connect to your, with your console. It was not designed to connect to anything but the official console, but they found a way. And in fact, all the age games have their own, uh, there are clients through which you can play all the age games online, even though the official servers for the first two games went down in the early 2000s. So, anyway, among that active community was uh, the Forgotten Empires team, which made a mod for Age of Empires 2 called the Forgotten, which added some new civilizations with their own bonuses and stuff, some new game mechanics, and they worked on this for years, brought it up to par to the point that it was a whole unofficial expansion pack to Age of Empires 2. So after it got to a really good point, they decided, hey, why don't we submit this to Microsoft? We've got something fantastic, maybe they'll do something with it, like make it an official expansion pack. So they did, and Age of Empires 2 got its first official expansion pack in years, over a decade, after the Conquerors. So around that same time, there was also a former Ensemble Studios employee who was spearheading an effort to bring Age of Empires 2 back online in the form of Age of Kings HD, which did come out on Steam, so with active online servers. And then after it came out, uh, the Forgotten Empires team was brought in to make their official expansion pack into an ex a DLC for Age of Kings HD. Forgotten Empires continued developing expansions for Age of Empires 2 HD edition. And in fact, now they are making Age of Empires 1, 2, and 3 in their definitive editions, which is kind of like an HD remaster, except a lot more because they're redoing all the graphics and most of the sounds and all the music. And yet they're building on top of the original game engines. So this is literally just a bunch of modders, huge fans of the games, who are at this point literally developing the games. And then there's also Age of Empires 4, developed by Relic, which has their 
uh, has some experience with World War II based RTS games. If that gives you an idea of what to expect of Age of Empires 4. Oh yeah, that's going to be fun. So that's where we're at today. And the next question is, what makes this game tick? Well, it's got a game engine written in C++, which as I said, we don't have the source code for, but we have a lot of uh, We've got a lot of tools to help us take apart the game, dissect it, add new things to it. I'm gonna about to switch monitors to an older machine, which has the first Age of Empires game and a bunch of modding tools, just because that'll be easier to show you everything on. I'll be using the first game, just for simplicity's sake, but everything I'm gonna show you works on Age of Empires 1, 2, uh, Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds, and Age of Empires 2 HD. All right, before I show you that, one more thing I've got here. If I can figure out how to get to the next slide. Uh, the unit models from Age of Empires. I said they brought in some artists who were uh, used to making like kind of movie quality CG uh, models. So I, I, I told Mr. if Bunker you guys have heard about how Donkey Kong was made, this is really similar. They took these 3D models that were like cinema quality. You couldn't have these in a game back then. And then had them like walking towards the camera, took a bunch of pictures, pieced those together into sprites, did the same thing for five different directions and then swapped it for left and right and ended up with sprites, highly detailed sprites for the time for units and terrain and all kinds of things. So th these are the in-game models, but in the game they are sprites. They're pretty pixelated when you look up close. You can't see that much detail in the actual game. I'll just be a moment to switch over. So welcome back to Windows XP. It's been like 10 years since you've been online. Anyway, so a lot of you guys are programmers. You probably know what strings are. First of all, uh, let's find the game. So I've got this icon leading to the game. As you probably all know, games are installed somewhere on your hard drive. So if we click Properties and then Find Target, we can find, hey, it's in C, Program Files, Microsoft Games. And then these files and folders are all the Age of Empires games. So if we mess with these, we are messing with the game. All right, so I mentioned strings. All the, uh, the language in the game is held in these DLL files, Dynamic Language Library. And if we open it up with a program called Resource Hacker, you can see there's string table and there's version info. Version info is just some basic info about the file, who made it, when it was finished, and then string table holds every single word of the in-game text. So if we go through here, there's some leader names, scroll down a little further, unit names, grass clump. Everything that's a word in this game is in here, and if we change it in here, it'll change in the game. So for instance, Let's change create filter to make babies. If we uh, find single, let's keep searching through here. Hey, that looks kind of like the main menu. Single player, multiplayer, help, scenario builder, exit. So let's change single player to, uh, I don't know, mushroom mode. Compile the script, save it. And now, since it's accessing this DLL when it starts up the game, we should see something different on the main menu. There we go, mushroom mode. Well, we can't see. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> see if I can do something about that.
I love working technology. There's always surprises. Let's see how this goes. Doesn't seem to like that. Bear with me here. Disable my own display. Hopefully that'll make it work. Oh, Dad, I, I think we're in good shape. TVs just are just kind of sluggish. So there we have it, mushroom mode. So using those editing strings like that, we can edit anything in the game. Another file type that's really easy to work with is the music. So the sound for this game is played in two different ways. Inside of this uh, sound folder, we've got all these MIDI files. And I don't know, if you guys are from the 90s, you might remember MIDI's, which are these little tiny music files. Instead of having recorded audio, they're basically sheet music, but in digital form. So it tells the computer, hey, play an E flat, play a C, play a D. And it gives it the timing, and it tells it what instrument to play that on. And then the computer basically uses a little virtual orchestra to recreate that music. So it's not quite as high quality as actual recorded music, but it fits a really tiny file size. And in the 90s, when you had like a 4 gigabyte hard drive, that's a big deal. Now the other way it plays music, if you have a CD in the drive, Age of Empires will actually play whatever music is on that CD. And that type of encoding they use is called a Red Book Audio CD. Any audio CD you buy at a store, like a record store, is a Red Book audio CD. So it's got, on the disc, That's there's like some track information. Tells it, hey, this track one starts here, track two starts here, track three starts here. And then there's also the actual music, which is just kind of not really in any file format system. It's just raw code. Now in Age of Empires, on the original disc, there was that track system, uh, that track player, just like on a CD. So if you put it in your car CD, it would skip to the uh, the music, the Red Book Audio portion of the game, and start playing this, the game soundtrack over your car CD player. Now in between those two, there was also the data layer of the CD, which held all the game files, all the install data, and the disc was kind of split in half between those two things. So it held the in-game music as well as all the game files. That's why if you open up Age of Empires with a Madonna CD in your CD drive, then you'll hear Madonna while you're playing. Oh, that's awesome. But anyway, with these MIDI files, it's as simple as taking a file and replacing the file, uh, the file that's in here with the one you want. So if we take X open, which is the menu music, let's knock that out of the way. So that's the original file there. Take something else. Uh, here's some Star Wars Cantina music. If we call it X open dot mid for the MIDI, and then drag it on in here. So when the game starts, it looks for X open dot mid, not X open zero. So. Once we get there, instead of playing the Age of Empires main theme, so if you want a little more pep in your Age of Empires, that's how you do it. All right, so music and text are nice, but let's go a heck of a lot deeper. So I used to mess with the music all the time when I was a kid. To really mess with the gameplay you've got to go into the data files, which are in these folders, data and data2. 
One of them is for the original game, the other one is for the expansion pack. The files in the expansion pack are actually a lot uh, smaller than their counterparts in the original one, because the expansion pack only contains changes to the original. So when you load Age of Empires with the expansion, it loads the original data file, and then it takes the expansion one. Anything that's, uh, any place they have the same value, or, yeah, if they have the same value for something and a different, it's hard to describe. So the, the expansion one will overwrite anything in the original if it wants to overwrite that portion of it. So it doesn't overwrite everything, only parts that it wants to. And then anything else that it has that's not in the original, it'll also have in there. So if it's unchanged, you'll have the original version. If it's changed, you'll have the expansion version. If it's new to the expansion, you'll have the expansion version. So we go in here. All of the game units and attacks, statistics, their information is in empires.dat, which is a .dat file. It's kind of weird. There's not really any standard way to open that. Because uh, the game engine was a proprietary thing that Ensemble Studios made. They actually spent a lot of time making proprietary tools so that people in their company could access that file, open it, edit things on the, uh, whenever they wanted. So if some unit was overpowered, they could take their in-house tool, go in and change it. But we don't have the, those kinds of tools since we don't work for Ensemble. But uh, modders worked really hard and looked at the file and figured out ways to uh, take it apart. So in this utilities folder, I've got a lot of different modding utilities. All these are community made. Not all of them are meant for Age of Empires, but pretty much all of them are. And one of them is AOE D, Rise of Rome D. It uses a command line interface. It actually doesn't work on newer versions of Windows because it's a 16-bit program, which cannot run on a 64-bit system. And you can decompress the genie file, that empires.dat file, into a, a readable text format. And then it also has a tool to uh, bring it back from text into, uh, like compress that all into a new data, database file, new data file that the game can use. So what it spits out is all these files, Civ 0, Civ 1, Civ 2. There's 16 civilizations in Rise of Rome, so that's why it goes up to 16. If you open one of these up, Units, you see Unit 0, it's got all the info for Unit 0, Unit 4, Unit 5, and this goes on quite a ways as you can see. And it's just got every single attribute of every unit. If you wanted to change this, you would take one of these, so uh, let's see. Gra uh, class. Different units have different classes, we can change that. Graphics for dying, there is no dying graphic on that unit, that's why it's negative one. But let's say we wanted to change the blast type of the attack of this unit. We would take that, put it into another uh, file, change it to whatever we want, and then go back in, find whatever else we want to change, grab it, put it in here, and then save this file as patches.txt. And then run that program again to recompress the data file. And it'll take everything in the patches file, bless you, and bring it into the data file. But, uh, lucky for us, uh, tools have gotten better since then. Around 20, I don't know, 2011. I won't give it a year because I'm not sure. We got the Advanced Genie Editor, another user-made tool. Looks like this version's from 2013. And this is actually has a graphical user interface. We can select the defaults for any of the games that the Genie Engine runs. So this will open up our game. Don't need a second window right now. And this is all that same information, but in a heck of a lot easier to read format. So, if we take an Egyptian, I don't know, Egyptian Academy, <coughs> we've got the graphics for it. We've got 
the language files for it are popped in here so that we can see them without, uh, we can see what the numbers are so we can easily find them if we're using resource hacker or something. Attack, hit points, armors, advanced commands and stuff. Pretty much everything you would need to make Age of Empires units. So if we take a villager for instance, and then find its walking speed right here. Change it from one. I like really fast villagers, so let's go 50. Save that. It saves it into the data file. A heck of a lot faster than that console-based program. Eventually these TVs come up. Not quite as responsive as the, as the CRT monitors they had back then. So let's be Egyptian and starting the fall. We should be starting in the Stone Age. We've got a friggin' lightning villager here. You can explore the whole map for us. It's really good thing it's all the space bars. Only the Egyptian villagers. So, type in some cheats. Fun fact, most of the cheats in this game were designed as testing tools. So you can just easily do these things to test. See if we got another Egyptian. Let's see if they're guys. Oh goodness, they are moving fast. They're Macedonian. Ah, uh, I had a checkbox. Nope. Yeah, I had a checkbox uh, for all civs. So it actually took that change to the villager and changed it in all the civilizations that have villagers. Now the reason you don't see that forager going super fast is because, another interesting thing, villager is one unit. Now if I tell him to chop wood, he becomes a woodcutter. He's not a villager anymore. That's actually a different unit in the data file. So he's got his own set of commands and stuff. That's why when you attack a deer, as a hunter, you throw spears. But if you attack an enemy as a villager, then you have a giant club. And I'm going to get the haste beat out of this guy. So they were all really fast when they were villagers, because they were a villager unit. Now they're back to foragers and hunters, woodcutters, back to normal speed. So one other thing you can do is make new units pretty much the same way. And that takes quite a bit longer, because not only do you have to add a unit, give it all the statistics it needs, usually you'd start by taking, a, uh, taking an existing unit, copying it, pasting it, that way most of these are in place. But you would also need to put it into the tech tree somewhere. Because your town center doesn't just spit out any village or, or any unit you have. We go to a building like Barracks. I'm oh, sorry, it's actually not in here. It's in, let's see, we've got a club in. The, the way he is made is, there is a train location attribute. And when you set that to Barracks, here we go, train location at the Barracks, and the train button is one. That's at the bottom panel of the screen when you have that button for a club man, that's in the first slot. If I were to put something else there uh, later on in the tech tree, like they make an axe man later on, the axe man button goes over top and overwrites the club man. So now that button makes axe man. So if I was to make a new unit with the same slot that was available at the same time, then it would probably be whatever unit is later on would get that slot. And then you could make it from there. So you can make new units, but it's not much good if you can't add new graphics with those units to make them look different. You can only go so far with all the graphics you've got in the game. So uh, something else kind of unique to, to this game, it's got another proprietary file format called the DRS file. We go to graphics.drs and open it up with a tool which is a part of Turtle Pack, a tool that came out in 2011. 
there were other more primitive tools, but this is a much more, I'd rather go with the advanced one, Turtle Pack. It has a DRS editor and an SLP editor. So what's an SLP? It's a graphic file. And what's a DRS? It's kind of a compressed format that holds SLPs and a few other formats. So kind of like a zip folder that has other folders inside, except uh, it doesn't need to be decompressed for the game to use it. In fact, it needs to be in that DRS file for the game to load it. So we've got all these different SLP files. And one thing to note, Age of Empires is a 256 color game. And not all 256 color palettes are the same. So you've got a set of 256 colors. If we take a different set of 256 colors, like the one from Age of Empires 2, suddenly that doesn't look so good. Because it's looking for, hey, what's the color in this slot? And it finds something, and that's not the right color. Not the same as it was in Age of Empires 1. So when you're making graphics, they've got to be in this, not only in 256 colors, but in the right 256 color palette to work with the game. So if I want to make, make some art for the game, this is not Windows 7, I can't just type. Start with a bitmap, because it was the 90s, so they used bitmaps for everything. make it about 10 by 10 so it fits in the game. If you try having something too big, it just kind of crashes. Oh man, it's a nacho of doom. Yeah, I have no idea. Let's say this, uh, Weapon of Mass Destruction as a bitmap file. So now we've got the bitmap. But, like I said, we can't just take a bitmap uh, that's more than 256 colors and put it in the game. So, let's go back to these utilities, go to Turbo Pack, and there's an SLP editor. First thing we do, take the bitmap, convert it to the Age of Empires 1 palette. So here's the WMD. Export it to this folder. And conversion ended, failed zero. That used to freak me out a lot, but failed zero means that there were zero failures. You can put in dozens of pictures in here. And if you're making an animation with lots and lots of sprites, you will have dozens of pictures in here. Knowing that one or two failed is a lot more important than just knowing failed or not failed. So now, let's add some animations, or add some frames to this animation. Not the original one, but this one that's in the correct 256 color palette. Zoom in a bit so we can see it. Oh no, there was a problem not the same color as before. That's because it was set to the Age of Empires 2 palette. So it converted it to the palette that would work in that game, not this game. So now if we add one in, the same file in? Okay. You hit replace existing file last time. You didn't change the location. Or you didn't All right, let's rename name. my numbers so we know we have a new one. that frame.
bring in this bad boy. Whoops. There we go. Got our nacho. So then you still gotta save this as an SLP file. It really helps to be Ensemble and have your own uh, custom built tools for this. In fact, I was using the older tools without uh, that they had like 10 years ago. This would take quite a bit longer. But Turtle Pack is pretty nice for a user made tool like it is. Now we can go back to graphics.drs. Let's go to graphic number 240, which is very bush. And let's replace this file with WMD. Now, if we come back to it, there is the Nacho of Doom. Save this graphics DRS file. So, if you've looked at a lot of Age of Empires mods, you'll notice there's not that many graphical mods because it is very difficult to make good units for this game. You gotta have them at the correct angle, because everything at the game is at, like, I think it's 140 degrees angle. Might be wrong on that. Somewhere around there. You gotta have a nice high quality animation, and then trying to get it to fit in with all the other uh, sprites in the game, you'd have to match the game's art style. So there's a lot of challenges to that. Spray brush has not changed. That's a good question. Is this supposed to change the terrain? Let's go to the scenario editor. It's a bit easier to test things there. <coughs> All right, so we have normal berry bushes. A lot of modding is just trial and error. So when guys were making uh, all the tools that they made for these games. Sometimes they were just guessing. Hey, does this work? No. Hey, does this work? No. Of course, to get really far, it takes a lot more than just guessing. So 240 is still the Nacho of Doom. Help us help out with this, we can refer back to the uh, Advanced Genie Editor, because it's got info about everything. If we look up Berry Bush, we've got graphics. Standing graphic is 333, but hold it, that's not the same as that other graphic number. That's because there's also, in the database, a storage of graphics. And this takes a bunch of frames from the DRS file and tells the game, hey, the Battle Arch 2, for instance, animation, graphic, is made up of SLPs from slot 204. And they've got this kind of frame rate, this many frames in each animation, how many directions, any sounds associated with it. So if we look up 303, SLP 240. Graphics, go to number 240, and there's a notch of doom, so hey, it's not in there. Maybe it's in the data 2 folder. And hey, there it is. The berry bush gets overwritten by the Rise of Rome's version of a berry bush. I'm not sure why Rome had advanced berry bushes, but if they change it in this, uh, in the past version, or in the expansion pack version, then you'll get the expansion pack version instead of the original. So, once we load it up here, save this.
our mushrooms. Yeah, there's a few other things that I've changed in this game. And hey, there's the Nacho of Doom. Let's go forage some Nachos of Doom. And it's still got the shadow of the berry bush, too. But yeah, that's how to change just about anything in Age of Empires. There's also uh, an interface.drs, which holds files for the, uh, like the interface, the top and the bottom borders here and the main menu and such. There's even, uh, and those are actually in different palettes in the original game, so there's another layer of complexity to editing those. But people have continued modding this game. One other thing you can do is hex editing, which gets really, really crazy. But if you're a good enough programmer, you can go into the, uh, the files of the game, or uh, any computer program, and take a look at the hex code.